slide with uh, uranium lead background. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. We're going to talk about what you guys can actually do with these tools, right? We had to get through the, the basics so that you guys have the framework. This is the fun stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Wei Allen. I am a new addition to the Arizona LaserCon uh, group as a postdoc. I just started about a month ago. So it's kind of getting up to speed with all of the new instrumentation that's kind of coming in and bringing that online. I did my undergrad at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. I did my master's at Purdue University and I stayed to do my PhD there where I'm actually finishing that part up where I'm working with Ken Ridgeway. So I do a lot of work in Alaska. So I was really excited to kind of hear about you guys doing work there. Um, I'm mainly a sedimentologist, but I do a lot of basin analysis work. So kind of more of the culmination of a lot of different fields. So that's kind of what drew me into geology. And I've actually had a lot of um, fun being able to visit LaserCron uh, multiple times, probably around eight or nine times uh, throughout my master's and my PhD work. So if you guys get a chance to go when um, COVID kind of calms down a little bit more, definitely recommend it. It's definitely a really fun experience. And today I'm going to be going over some of the um, applications with the geochronology work. I will remove it. I have the game technical skills. I know. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> we have spoken too soon. Almost got to the end of this. Okay. So now this should work. Yeah. So these two buttons will. Okay. Let's see if I can actually use a pointer. Yeah. For those also virtually. Um, yeah. So we're going to go over really quickly, um, kind of when looking at the tridal zircons, really looking at um, using it as a tool to look at sources. So this is where provenance comes in mind. And if you're also just really interested in looking at the general age of a certain sample, that's where a maximum depositional ages or max depo age comes to be important. And this is ultimately, especially if you're looking at really large terrain and regional type of tectonics, this is when um, characterization of those ages start to become really important. And in these photos, that's just, for example, if you're looking at large scale sediment transports is what these arrows are showing here. You wanna look then at sampling sandstones and that's where you start to look at individual grains. And this is where it becomes really fun for me. I love field geology. So getting to get on some outcrops to actually look at what the geology looks like up close, but when you're actually formulating your hypothesis and the type of question that you're trying to answer, it starts to become really important of how you actually pick your samples. When you come up to an outcrop like this, are you going to pick one sample just from the top or are you going to pick a sample from just the base of this outcrop? And also really paying attention to the overall character of, for example, here it's like a sandstone. So you can look at certain grain size or are you just going to target a certain bed here or do you want to have multiple samples throughout this whole outcrop and depending on the overall formation type that you're actually looking at you may actually be able to capture a lot of the similar ages throughout this um, particular section here and for the type of work that i do i'm have been more concerned with the maximum depositional age so i'd be interested in mainly looking at the top and bottom of the section because I was interested in mainly looking at um, how ages change within a particular section. But if I wanted to be very detailed, you could do more than 20 samples as you're moving your way up section here. And what's really important to focus on here is that you're going to see changes in the differences of ages and the number of those different ages based on the type of grains that you're analyzing. And 
this is where in the lab it starts to become really important to limit the amount of bias that you start to introduce when you're doing your sampling and this comes down to the overall morphology when it comes to zircons so you want to pay attention to size morphology and magnetic susceptibility and this is all done mainly at um, laser cron if you're going to have uh, the center actually process your samples or if you're going to do your own sample processing this would be um, more important for you where you don't want to be only selecting for example only small grains or only large grains you want to be able to reduce that bias by being able to look at all the different unknowns in you kind of touched on this earlier, but essentially once you get your individual zircon grains to the lab, they'll be mounted in epoxy, which is shown here by a puck. And I think uh, Chris, or Chris, Kurt even has like a puck up here if you want to look at it. Um, and on this mount, what you'll essentially have are standards and unknowns. And in this particular mount, those standard and unknowns are just mounted just in the center here. And what occurs down at the lab is that you're actually kind of lightly polishing down to a smooth surface so that you actually are just uh, cleaning off the surface to look at just your zircons. And this is where all the imaging starts to happen after you did polishing is this is where you do a lot of your BSE imaging and cathode luminescence imaging or CL imaging. And this is, uh, again, um, kind of keeping in mind the type of biases that can pop up is that if you look at this image up here, you can already see there are some different morphologies associated with some of these zircon grains. Some of them are rounder than others. Some are a little bit more euhedral. And that can kind of play a role into maybe you just like euhedral grains. And that's a way to introduce some biases. But once you get into the BSE image phase here, this is a nice image of what you typically see um, with some of these grains that maybe if you uh, send them to the lab, um, what you want to do as you're placing spots on certain parts of the grains is that you want to be able to just put spots essentially randomly on different unknowns and not preferentially place spots just on larger grains just because they're easier to do. You want to be able to have a good spread and try to think about it in the sense that you're trying to capture as much information as you can per sample. And on the bottom row, these are all different types of SEM imaging. So this becomes really important for igneous ages or igneous samples where you really want to look at the really internal uh, portions of certain grains and if you are more important or what's more important to you is just the center of the grain which is going to be more of your original crystallization age are you interested in the overgrowth so if you're just interested in more of the metamorphic phases or when these on zircons would be growing and these are just some really pretty images that um, or up here just to give you some idea of the type of complexities in terms of zonation that can occur in um, some zircon grains. And the next question is, how many analyses per sample do you want to do? Um, on here, just mainly showing some of the more of the background history of how this has progressed, starting with uh, Dotson, who started out with analyzing 60 grains per sample. And what slowly started happening or what can be um, observed from this slide is that we've progressively increased from 60 to over 600. Now, right now um, at LaserCon, we're trying to go more into greater than a thousand grains. And this is particularly for the trital samples. Um, so essentially what you wanna do is be able to have more accuracy in characterizing your samples. So you want to be able to capture um, different types of age populations that are there within your sample uh, data. And 
And when it comes to actually having these different ages, once you have them, is what can you actually say? What's actually like worth basing an interpretation off of? Um, but generally, the rule of thumb is that you want something that's more robust. So this would be more of a selecting ages that are three or more overlapping at a particular area. So on here, you would be more interested in this cluster of ages, or even better would be like a better, bigger cluster of ages here. And when it comes to looking at your plots of um, lead and uranium ages, what you want to pay attention to is that um, if you have these areas where you have only one or two analyses that may or less be telling you more about their perturbation within a certain uh, zircon grain that had been analyzed and maybe that's not as well constrained and just have like a more careful type of selection when it comes to, especially when it comes to maximum depositional age. Um, Then for keeping that in mind, as you look at some of the sample age distributions that you have is that if you're looking particularly at really younger grains, that starts to play more into a role if you want to look mainly at um, grains that are younger than 1.4 GA, you want to be more interested in more of the lead 206 to lead 238. But once you get older and you want to save more on Concordia, that becomes more important to use the 206 to 207 ages that are up here. And I wasn't sure if there was anything else on this slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to double check. Yeah, and um, especially for the trital zircon data, I'm definitely more familiar with using uh, probability density plots to represent the data. And this is essentially you're using a sum of all the individual analyses, which is represented with this red curve here. And underneath these would be um, individual zircon grains that would, what you would get out of um, doing an analysis like using the mass spec and laser. And you want to use that more as a representation of the overall age populations that you're showing per sample. Oh, and I should mention that these this line also incorporates the uncertainties that are associated with each um, individual zircon grain within this overall profile. Another way to represent your data, and I've seen this mainly in looking at larger regional data sets with more than a thousand zircon grains is really looking at the overall cumulative um, probability density plots, which is essentially summing all of the analyses in one single profile. And you essentially build yourself all the way up to one here. And in the next slide, or in a couple of slides, I'll show you what the example looks like. Oh, shoot. Oh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> I got it. And um, so if you look at the probability density plot, what's being shown here on the x axis is from zero to three GA. And on the y axis, these are actually the number of grains. And that corresponds to these blue histograms here that you can, in some programs, like with isoplot, which is kind of now being faded out, you could actually set the overall bin age that you're interested in displaying in your data set. And this y-axis would correspond to the number of grains associated with that particular histogram height. And in the background with this uh, red line, this is your overall probability density plot. So this becomes a little more interesting to actually look at their overall age and uncertainty associated with the entire sample. But you could also look in terms of um, the number of grains associated with each peak, which kind of gives you a little bit more information of how representative um, that is for your sample. 
And another uh, couple of ways to look at certain data sets is to actually normalize um, samples against each other. So essentially, you're plotting probability density plots, but you're also keeping a baseline of having the same area under the curve for each sample that you want to show. So this kind of helps with overall comparisons against each other in terms of uh, being able to look at it almost quickly of how related some samples look like to each other based on the overall profiles of the ages that are represented. Whereas I think if we move back to this slide here, you can have more um, flexibility in terms of adjusting the y-axis to look at individual like number of grains. Whereas here, everything's kind of set to a certain baseline um, in a normalized uh, distribution. And in this bottom right corner, what we're seeing here is mainly if, for example, if you have multiple cumulative um, probability density plots for a lot of different samples, then you could look at it in a more, I guess, simplistic way of seeing different age distributions where uh, the x-axis is from 0 to 3.5 GA. On the y-axis, it's kind of covered up here. It goes all the way to 1. So as you're summing all of the different analyses for a particular sample, those all climb to one here, but what you're able to do is look at multiple um, samples next to each other on the same graph. And this is a another type of way to look at your data set is to look at a cumulative probability density plot by looking at for example, two of them would be this blue line is one sample, this red line is one sample, but there's a certain spread between the two. So if you wanted to look at the more of the statistics behind it, uh, you could try to look a little bit more into um, how what the probability is that these samples may come from the same population. And I think Kurt's going to talk a little bit more in detail about this with uh, the DZ stats program. But essentially what would be more looked into here is that whether or not your samples who actually might be coming from the same um, age population and there's like a statistical backing behind that of the higher probability and confidence associated with that. And as I mentioned before, with the plotting some PDPs, it starts to become really important, especially if you're interested in maximum depositional age. You start to look at these individual peak ages, so you may be interested in this population down here. And what we mean by the youngest age is that you're kind of interested in this really young population. And yeah, was not too sure about what this inset is? Yeah, this is just one of our one of the youngest youngest Okay. And yeah, and I guess the way to get that, getting out of that um, uncertainty area is to actually look in more detail at the individual grains that are surrounding that and to actually take a weighted mean age to look at the individual analyses that have been measured and to have a more confidence that what you're looking at is actually real is to do a method like this where you can see how well those ages are starting to overlap with each other and whether or not your youngest age that you're observing in a certain peak is actually too young, which would mean that you might have some lead loss that's kind of 
be measured here in maybe you have a better confidence that more of your clusters are here that you would want to confidently have that as more of your maximum depositional age. Another way to look at some of the another maximum depositional age is to continually looking at certain clusters and this is a, another plot of using this tough zircon age, which is part of the isoplot program. But again, I think the isoplot program is slowly starting to be phased out in favoring more of a MATLAB based approach. But essentially, like you're still interested in these um, clusters that will give you a more robust age is kind of what you're going for for uh, maximum depositional age. And there's another method that's called a mixing, where say that you have one larger peak that's kind of represented in a PDP that looks like one overall peak. But what you start to notice is that maybe there's a difference in some of the histograms below that peak that suggests maybe you have one or two different populations. And one way you could do that is to use an unmixing age program to try to split those ages apart to see how well um, that is represented within that overall um, unimodal population before. And maybe there's actually two peak ages that you could actually look at. And based on the overall um, error that's associated with it, you may be able to specify that maybe that younger peak isn't as a robust point as you would like it to be, and maybe that it's actually more of an older age that's more robust. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question was um, when do you actually start to plot the data like this? Right. Uh, in which method to use. Um, yeah, and I guess it, it just kind of depends on the type of sample that you're going to, I guess it attempt to, uh, depends on the type of sample that you have. So if you have a, for example, the trital zircon sample, what you might want to think about is so usually what I do is I start out with like a PDP, like this overall, like what is the overall profile look like? And if I'm like really interested in a certain age population, then that's kind of when I start to go more into the de more detailed. And that's where a lot of these other like little tools start to come important. For example, if I notice that this maximum depositional age seems a lot older than what I thought it was gonna be, then maybe I would want to look at the certain zircon clusters within that certain spread of ages and then start to go more into detail of unmixing to see how real some of these peaks are before totally basing my interpretations on it. And these are just really tools to help you hone in to how good your interpretation is based on like what you're looking at and the relative uncertainties associated with certain parts of it. because. Essentially, you just want to be able to represent your data more accurately in the way that you're interpreting that. And these other additional little tools are just helping you kind of be more accurate in that sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
So that's assuming that um, the ages are coming from the same source. Let's see. And so this is another method of how you could um, show some of your data too, is um, using the kernel density estimate, which is one method I'm not as familiar with, but essentially what you're doing is you're having histograms that you can essentially set the overall and the certainty associated with each analysis and what essentially happens is that it kind of over smooths the data in some cases and this is just showing um, what some of those would look like so these red lines are mainly the PDPs, so these would be the original PDP estimates in the back would be more of the kernel density estimates. So if you have really wide histograms that are binning to probably on the order of um, 20 million years here, that you could actually over smooth some of the data sets here. Um, yeah, not as familiar with the kernel density estimate in how they're being used in some places. Like, I don't see it as often within published data. I've mainly just seen the PDPs here. And this is just a summary of um, some of the best practices to think about. So if you are doing field work and you have to pick a place to sample, just really think about the question that you're trying to answer with your sampling strategy. Are you really concerned about the age of the overall strata that you're looking at? Um, or are you just trying to do a really detailed characterization that requires a lot of sampling? And when it comes to processing your sample, if you're doing it yourself especially, really pay attention to the overall biases that you might be introducing based on your overall selection of grains. And that comes down to also when you, if you do come to the lab to pick grains is to keep in mind the overall different biases associated with just being a user on the laser of selecting grains. And especially if you have igneous uh, samples, CL images become really important, especially if you're looking at particular um, histories associated with those grains. And uh, we always recommend that you want to analyze as many grains as you can. So if you can get more than 300 grains for a trial zircon sample, that's really going to be more of the robust A part of um, doing your analyses. So it'll help capture the overall age proportions that you're interested in, especially for your sample. And really pay attention to the different types of filters that are associated, especially with um, when it comes down to data reduction, this is what Sarah had talked about is that 
we do reduce the data for you, but it's also part of your job as a researcher to kind of look through that to see if that's the type of filters that you want to have applied. And Kurt's going to go through in a little bit more detail of um, what it's like to reduce some of the data and kind of um, get a feel for the types of filters that are applied after analyses are performed. And as Sarah mentioned, when it comes to presenting your data, there's a lot of different options out there. And it all depends on like what is either more consistent across all these different methods. So is that the more accurate way of presenting your data in it? Each method is showing that um, there isn't any type of major um, unsimilarity between the two, then or dissimilarity between the different methods, then you more than likely are biasing your samples or being very cherry picking about what you're actually showing. In a good rule of thumbs, just to stick with um, where your ages are clustering, especially with the trial data to base some of your interpretations on to have more accurate interpretations. And when it comes down to provenance, we'll probably go into more detail with uh, Kurt here about some of the statistical comparisons in addition to just the KS analysis is that sometimes you do want to look in more detail, and when you, especially when you're comparing your, the trial zircon samples to really large regional data sets. Sometimes you're more curious about how similar some age populations are to others that are seen within other data sets, and you can do that really quickly uh, as long as your data sets in the right format. And when it comes down to depositional age, there's a variety of different ways to kind of get at that based on the overall robustness of the data that you're after. And if you you go down that path, there's a lot of different um, tools out there to help you with that. And I think that's all I have for this slide deck. Um, you guys have any other questions? Or George, do you have any, any questions in the chat? Yeah, nothing has come in on the chat. So we'll see if anybody in person there has any questions or comments. I think we answered all the questions so far. All right. 